Please join me in welcoming to Google New York, Louisa Shafia. Thanks, Stephanie. So your book opens with a really great introduction to your history and your heritage. Can you start by telling us a bit about your personal story and your connection with Persian food? Sure. Well, my dad is from Iran. Mm -hmm. He grew up in a town called Kazvin, which I am not saying in a nearly guttural enough way. It's really <laughs> Kazvin. <laughs> and then he moved to Tehran as a teenager. And then he came to the US, to Philadelphia to be exact, to finish his um, medical degree. So he came from a large Muslim family. And in Philly, he met my mom, who is an American Ashkenazi Jew. <laughs> Very interesting. And they fell in love and got married. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up with a very diverse household in Philadelphia. And, you know, as most Iranian men, my dad wasn't doing a ton of cooking, <laughs> but my mom wanted to make the dishes of his homeland that he loved. So she really taught herself how to make Persian dishes. And so, you know, Maybe once every few weeks on a Sunday, my mom would start the long, slow process mm -hmm. of making a big Persian feast for us. And my dad would help. I got to give him credit. He would help. And um, but I these flavors weren't kind of my everyday flavors. They were just part of part of my world. It wasn't until I was an adult and really exploring all different kinds of culinary traditions that I kind of realized this awesome food heritage that I have. Yeah. Did you do, did you grow up cooking with your mom or was it something that you explored later on in life? Like how did you find that interest in cooking? Yes, I was recruited by my mom at around <laughs> age five, no joke, to uh, help prepare for dinner parties and gatherings that she would have. My mom loves to entertain and she's an amazing cook herself. I'm, I'm sure that's where I got the, the bug to love to cook. <laughs> And, uh, but you know, she would have us, my sister and I prepare crudite platters and very simple desserts and, and omelets. And so I just grew up feeling very comfortable experimenting with food. So that's for sure where it comes from. That's so interesting. And this is your second cookbook that's out. And you've also written for numerous, you know, numerous articles for publications, Food 52, The Wall Street Journal, how did you get interested in writing about food? Was that something that was also from a young age or was it something that you found when you were older? I really got into writing after I had my catering company for mm -hmm. a couple of years. I, I had a, a catering company called Lucid Food mm -hmm. that was all about sustainable catering, really bringing the world of eco-friendly thinking and locavore approach to eating mm -hmm. to the world of fine dining, You know, doing something more interesting than pigs and blankets at, you know, nice corporate events. And uh, people got really excited that you could have these beautiful, elegant hors d'oeuvres that, you know, were all sourced from the farmer's market and everything was being, you know, composted along the way. And no one was really doing it in New York at that time. And people were so curious and excited by this because they, they hadn't really come across it before. That, that's when I got inspired to write my first cookbook, mm -hmm. which is seasonal cooking mm -hmm. and eco-friendly tips for the kitchen. And I just kind of wanted to take all that experience that I'd gotten with my catering company and all those things I shared and share them with a bigger audience in a book. Interesting. So this book is called, the new book is called The New Persian Kitchen. What is your definition of the new Persian kitchen? Well, the new Persian kitchen well, I should say in context, Persian cooking mm -hmm. has a very different timeline than, say, American cooking or even European cooking. Persian cooking goes back literally thousands of years. So at the ruins of Persepolis, which was the ancient ritual capital of the Persian Empire, mm -hmm. of what is now modern-day Iran, the makings of fesenjun stew, which is one of the most iconic stews eaten today in Iran. It's made from ground walnuts and pomegranate molasses. All the makings of that were found uh, written on stone tablets at, at Persepolis. So even back then, they were using pomegranates, they were using walnuts, they were using parsley, they were using uh, garlic. 
So when you say the new Persian kitchen, um, you know, it's taking something that's very ancient and kind of riffing on it. So my, I'm sort of doing a take on Persian food that's very much inspired by this ancient cuisine, by the very um, sensuous ingredients like saffron and rose water and sumac, and kind of filtering it through my own very healthy way of eating. Mm -hmm. So putting in whole grains instead of white rice, um, cutting back on sugar, really trying to put the emphasis back on fresh fruits and vegetables, which really are the foundation of Persian food. So the inspiration for this cookbook would be, was it founded more in your heritage? Was it wanting to express you know, your new techniques and connect them back with your roots? Like, where did this inspiration come from to write this book? Well, I entered the professional culinary world uh, with a, a very strong focus on healthy cooking. In fact, I was vegan when I started my career as a chef. That's interesting. <laughs> yes. And I went to a very healthy cooking school. It's called the Natural Gourmet Institute. It's here in New York. And I was vegan at the time I entered. All of my teachers at the school were middle-aged women, and they all told me being <laughs> vegan was the worst thing I could do for my health. So I left cooking school no longer vegan. And uh, after I finished, I moved to San Francisco to cook at this awesome vegan restaurant called Millennium. And I have to say, one of my first meals in San Francisco was at Luna Park. Really? And I had fish for the first time in a few years. And I'm bringing that up because you said you used yeah. to work there. That's how I got my start at Google, was as a hostess at Luna Park, in case you guys want to. Yeah. <laughs> great restaurant. It's a great restaurant. Still open, too. Still going strong. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, so I started cooking at Millennium, loved it, was so inspired by all the different ingredients we were using. You know, in San Francisco at that time, that was 2001, everyone was already deeply into the locavore thing, and we had farmers coming to the back door of the restaurant dropping off, you know, foraged mushrooms and chilies and all kinds of cool things. So one day, my chef asked me if I would come up with a new dish for the menu, and you know, we were already using a huge diversity of ingredients, you know, Korean things, Japanese, African. And my first thought was, what can I do that no one's done here yet? Nice. And I knew nobody had done Persian food. I just knew it, because there's not a lot of Persians or Persian restaurants in the Bay Area. And so I thought, I think I'll do, I'll try Fess and June, which is pomegranate and walnut stew, usually made with either turkey or chicken or sometimes duck. And I did Sounds a vegan good. version of it. It's the ingredients are magical. That combination of the bitter walnuts and the tart and sweet pomegranate, that's so kind of all you need. And it almost doesn't matter if there's meat in it or not. It's just so good. So I didn't know how to cook with any Persian ingredients at that time. It was a, a huge process of discovery for me. And I, you know, I found some different versions of recipes for Fess and June, and I muddled my way through it and came up with something. Everyone tasted it and said, whoa, what is this? This is so great. It's sweet, and it's tart, and it's rich, and, and it's beautiful. You know, I added some um, grated red beets to the dish to make it a beautiful deep red color. And it went on the menu, and everyone liked it. And that was really the start of me discovering this amazing food heritage that I had grown up with but had never been aware of. That's so cool. Do you find that there's a there is an opening within you know, vegan style food for more Persian cooking. It feels like it'd be a pretty good fit. I mean, yes, there's the yogurt and there's the meat, but do you think that there's you know, an opportunity to ex expand that vegan lifestyle with you know, more immersion of like Persian food and the ingredients? Do you think there's? Absolutely. Persian food is all about the flavors. And traditionally, you know, meat was used to just boost the flavor of things that it was never had a starring role. Mm -hmm. It's only kind of now that meat is so much more accessible and cheap that you'll see, you know, these huge kebab fests yeah. and, uh, you know, super meaty stews. Mm -hmm. But traditionally, meat was just a small element. And you can do these dishes completely without meat if you're doing 
you know, there's all these classic stews like like fesson June. There, there's bottom June, which is eggplant and tomato stew. There's gourmet sabzi, which is herbs. It's all green herbs when it's finished. It's this beautiful, vibrant That's green color. So nice. And uh, it's it's really flavored with something called dried limes, which is a very particular Persian ingredient, and it's kind of like lime times twelve because you cook with I the read whole that lime. In the book, and I was like, what is this dried lime? I want to try it. Oh, they're, they're so, so good. They're super sweet and uh, and kind of bitter at the same time, but. It's all about those flavors, so you really don't need the meat. And in my cookbook, I try and give a vegetarian or even a vegan version of all of the meat dishes because the whole point is to make use of the fruits and vegetables. And here, I want to point out that Iran always had an abundance of fresh fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables and herbs, very much unlike a lot of other parts of the Middle East. But Iran has a temperate climate. It has yeah. four seasons. It's surrounded by two mountain ranges that are covered with snow mm -hmm. uh, throughout the whole year, which most people, I'm sure, think of Iran as just a big desert. Mm -hmm. But it's not. There's, you know, there's marshy areas and meadows and mountain ranges and very, very diverse um, geography. But the ancient Iranians figured out a way to bring the melted snow water from the mountains into vast desert areas and have these lush gardens growing in, in the desert. Yeah, they're, I mean, the irrigation systems are something that's, you know, known historically that they've been able to develop this amazing, these amazing lush gardens. And it's depicted in books and stories and movies, and it's really fascinating. And I feel like that comes across in your book really well through your writings, but also through the imagery and through your emphasis on herbs and on produce, and even taking different, you know, like the limes, which were fantastic. There's like a bit about the caramelized onions too that it just, it's so interesting how you take fresh ingredients and you can just build and build and build these really amazing dishes. Yes, and thank you for bringing up the caramelized onions. Caramelized onions is something you see in many, many Persian dishes. It's often used as a topping for things, and that is a great way to bring a foundation of really deep, rich flavor into yeah. a dish, even if it doesn't have meat. So if you're trying to make these dishes vegetarian, mm -hmm. take the time to make some really nice, slowly cooked caramelized onions. They, they will fill in for the flavor of meat and, and really round out a dish in, in a very powerful way. It takes a little time. It can take about an hour to really do it the right way. You know, you start on high heat with your, with your thinly sliced onions, then reduce the heat and just let them cook down, cook down until they're really dark and just a fraction of their size. And they so are good. Mm, sweet and rich and smoky, everything you want. So good. Do we have caramelized onions today in the cafe? We do. I hope we do after that <laughs> description. So talking, you know, again, like there's these amazing traditional ingredients and your, you know, culinary interests in, and personal interest in vegan food. Um, this, the recipes in this book are really, they are a mix of like traditional and innovative. And can you tell us a bit about how you curated the recipes in this book and how this collection came together? Sure. Well, it was kind of a process of discovery. Um, I had originally wanted to go research this cookbook in Iran, but I wasn't able to get the documentation to go, and I was very sad about that. And then a friend of mine said, why don't you just go to Los Angeles? <laughs> <laughs> and if you don't know, Los Angeles has the biggest Iranian population outside of Iran. And a lot of my extended Iranian family is out there. I have at least 20 family members out there. And I thought, oh, that's a great idea because, you know, I won't have to wear a, a chador and cover my head and I'll be able to get around and, you know, I speak the language, English. <laughs> so I went out there and, um, you know, kind of in my honor of being out there, we had all these amazing family feasts. That's so cool. It was so cool, you know, these all day feasts, you know, you get there at 12 or one on a Sunday and you leave at maybe nine or 10, you know, you've had about three rounds of food and you're just feeling super happy and tons of black tea in between every meal. And, you know, from that, I got to kind of see the favorite dishes that everybody made, you know, Sholazard, the sweet, rice pudding with, with saffron, um, 
rice with dates, adas polo, mm -hmm. all these different dishes. So I got to see the ones that my family members really loved, and I got to taste those. And then I thought, okay, you know, I really like this one, I like that one, I'm gonna, you know, try my own recipe for this. And then my relatives took the time to get in the kitchen with me. So I would come over for these intense all-day cooking sessions cool. with, with my cousins, and, you know, they showed me really step-by-step step how they made some of their favorite dishes, like rice with, um, fava beans and dill, which is just a beautiful dish for, you know, anytime that stuff is in season. And so I really learned that way. And then being there, I was able to shop at all these Persian grocery stores because I had all the ingredients on hand like I had never had in New York. So, you know, I could get rose petals, I could get, um, you know, date syrup, dried limes, uh, barberries, anything I needed, mm -hmm. and just play around and experiment in my kitchen. And so through that process, I kind of chose some of those classic dishes from the Persian canon. They, they kind of have a canon of classic rice dishes, classic stews, classic desserts. Right. So I took some of those and then I just created some that were inspired by like, um, there's a chicken dish in the book. It's turmeric chicken with sumac and lime. And I really Which wanted to have, today. oh yes, it's featured. on today's menu. It looks so good. I can't wait to taste yeah. their version of it. But I wanted to make a dish that was encapsulated all the flavors of Persian cooking, but didn't take several hours and only used a handful of ingredients. So, you know, you just season the, the chicken thighs or breasts with a little bit of uh, turmeric and salt, sear them in a pan, then add some water and garlic and let it braise for 25 minutes. Take it out, season with some lime juice and some sumac powder. So you've got you've got a lot of tartness in there. You've got saltiness. You got richness from the from the chicken, nice. and it's really well rounded and full. So it tastes like you were cooking all day, mm -hmm. but it's kind of for an American's modern you know tolerance of how much time you want to spend in the kitchen. Yeah, it's really one of the other things I loved about this book is that it is it's a book that's you can it's so useful it's so just connects immediately like there's so many recipes in there that you could make in a tiny kitchen in Manhattan you could also make in a huge kitchen in LA and it's so it's so approachable that I just I kept flipping through and being like I want to make this dish no I want to make this dish and it's really really vibrant and really amazing and the ingredients that you talk about too are so vast fantastic but possibly not you know the most some of the ingredients, what I thought was interesting is that you, they may not be found in, in the form in the, in the book of the recipes, but you give instructions on how to make them, or even sometimes substitutions, which mm -hmm. I thought was really helpful. Um, if you had to suggest a few key ingredients to have in your house to cook from your book or to cook Persian food, what would they be? Oh, I love that question. Mm. Turmeric would be one. Uh, sumac, which is a little purple powder that comes from sumac berries, not poison sumac, yeah. just edible sumac. <laughs> they look completely different, two different plants. And it sort of serves the purpose of lemon juice, but you don't need to have a fresh lemon around. Mm -hmm. It's tart and kind of salty and Same. actually very high in vitamin C. Um, pomegranate molasses, which is just pomegranate juice cooked down, again, mm -hmm. tart and sweet. Dried limes, which, you know, maybe aren't that easy to find in a store, but there's lots of places you can order them online and they keep forever. And I guess dried mint, which you can throw into it's any good. dish and transform the flavor and make it exotic and, and Eastern just, just by adding that at the end. Interesting, dried mint. I'm gonna and add it's, that. It's spearmint in particular. Spearmint. So it's not peppermint and it's not just general mint, it's really spearmint that has that real fullness and that real savory taste. And the difference too, I'm glad you clarified that, of like spearmint versus peppermint, it's really interesting. Um, in your book, it states that according to Persian tradition, foods can either heat your body up or cool it down. And it's typically advised that you keep these energies carefully balanced. So with that in mind, can you recommend a balanced meal according to Persian tradition? Sure, so a classic balanced meal is actually a kebab platter, which is your kebabs, mm -hmm. which are hot by nature. Meat is hot. Mm -hmm. You have your rice, 
which, you know, can be studded with anything from nuts to dried fruit to meat to, to fresh herbs. You have um, grilled tomatoes on there. And then you're always going to have sumac sprinkled over the rice, and that is cooling. And you're always going to have a glass of duch, which is a salty mint yogurt soda. <laughs> sounds weird. That sounds very So unique. delicious. <laughs> It's just yogurt with, I like to make it with sparkling water. You could make it with flat. Put a little bit of dried mint in there, some salt, a little bit of garlic. Wow. And it is so good. And that is really, really cooling. And that's why you have it with that meal. Iranians have a very specific philosophy about healthy eating that, again, goes back thousands of years, just like Ayurvedic cooking and dietary rules and just like traditional Chinese medicine, Iranians have this theory that goes back and you always want to stay balanced. If you get too much of hot or too much of cold, mm -hmm. you're going to get sick. Very interesting. Your first cookbook, as you mentioned, was focused on you know, eco-friendly food. Um, this book focuses on your heritage and more of traditional Persian elements. Will the readers see any similarities between the book or the two books or is it a pretty different route from your first book? Uh, there's a lot of common ground between the two. It's funny, with the first book, I only had, um, I guess, a couple of chicken dishes and some fish dishes in there. I was really true to my vegetarian heritage. In this book, meat is such a sort of integral part of Persian cooking. It, you know, it's really one of the characteristics of, of all these classic Persian stews and uh, rice, even if it's just a small amount. So I really wanted to be true to that, so I debated a while, but I did end up including lamb, which is the meat that you'll find most often in Iranian cooking, um, lots of chicken, um, a fair amount of fish and seafood dishes, which they have all different kinds of fish in Iran, down by the Persian Gulf, there's one kind, uh, up near the Caspian Sea, there's, there's different kinds. So I did include those, and then I really have an emphasis on cooking with whole grains, mm -hmm. finding healthy alternatives to, you know, maybe less healthy ways of cooking. If you go to a Persian restaurant these days, you'll often find dishes that are made with a lot of oil. So I have suggestions for cutting down on oil and also using healthier cooking oils like coconut oil, things like almond oil, um, using extra virgin olive oil for garnishing at the end. So you can definitely tell that both books were written by a health nut. <laughs> That's the common ground. That's great. What was your favorite discovery of writing this book, your second cookbook? So you are familiar, you've written a book before, but what was your favorite discovery of this particular journey? Gosh, I mean, there were so many little particular food things that I discovered, just like the whole ingredient dried, dried mint. I loved discovering that. But I think the bigger thing for me was the opportunity to really get to know my Persian family and get this opportunity to really be immersed in the culture like I had never been growing up in Philadelphia. And I think just really understanding that and, and also understanding that I was part of this, this sort of bigger tribe, if you will, and yeah. going out to LA and looking around and seeing that everybody looked like me, <laughs> that was an amazing discovery and a completely cool. new feeling. So cool. So besides your cookbooks, what is a cookbook that people, that you would recommend, like a must-have cookbook that you would recommend for people to have? Yes, just yesterday I was looking at it. Yeah. Uh, it's called The Legendary Cuisine of Persia by a woman named Margaret Shaida, S-H-A-I-D-A. Hmm. She was an English woman who married an Iranian and, and lived in Iran for decades. She's no longer alive, but her book is available, and it, it taught me so much, and it's got all kinds of great stories about the, you know, the folk traditions that are behind a lot of the specific dishes, and you know, the role of religion in Iran, and the role of geography, and how it really affected how each part of the country has a very different regional cuisine. It, and it's really written in a lyrical way. It, it's just beautiful, and she puts some Thing. She's able to express some things about Persian cuisine and Persian culture in ways that just 
can't even be improved upon. It's good making a note of that one. Um, so in this digital age, technology um, is so ever, I mean, ever present, we're at Google. How do you see technology changing or affecting the way that you approach traditional foods or cooking or sharing the information about this, this rich history um, through food? Well, I feel like now it's so easy with video to show how you would make a dish that yeah. once was believed very, very complicated. Like, for example, something like tadig, which is a traditional part of any Persian meal. It's the crispy rice on the bottom of a pot. And it's, it's golden and it's crisp so and it tastes good. like potato chips and popcorn and fried chicken all in one. So if you tried to just describe that, in words, it's so subtle and there are so many different little tips that you need to carry out to actually make it successfully. But with a video, you know, there's so many great instructional cooking videos out there now. You can show people exactly how they, they can do it and learn how to do it like an expert at home. So cool. Yeah, I definitely, it's amazing to see how many, you know, these days how many people are learning to cook from videos and people will find, you know, information online. I still have my, I love my cookbooks. I mean, I will, I will keep them forever. Um, but it's interesting to see that, you know, and how the two complement each other too, that it's like book to video, back to the book when you're cooking and moving around. And there is something that was still so beautiful about having that book present in your kitchen as opposed to a laptop, you know, or yes. your phone. You can't really hold your phone and cook at the same time. So it's really, I think there's a beauty in essence in, in the cookbooks and especially in yours. The, the photos are wonderful and it's such like, you can tell it's such a culturally rich book. It's really amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And just one more thing on that that I want to <laughs> say is also with things like Twitter and you know just so much sharing online, I can be talking with people in Iran and getting recipe tips and asking True. them how they do things and you know getting an immediate response and having this dialogue that I really wouldn't have otherwise. It just makes us so much closer and makes the ability to share ideas really easy. Yeah, and tips. That's really interesting. So cool. I love that idea of like when you're cooking something that's, you know, historically and heritage from a, a different country, a different land, and using technology to get instant information about like, oh, I'm making this, I'm not quite sure. Does anybody have any recommendations? And you can, you can get information like just instantaneously that shifts your entire process. So, so interesting. So you have two cookbooks catering company, you're a food writer, what is going to be next for you? You know, I'm really thinking about it. Um, I feel like I'd like to bring these flavors to people in an easier way, so I'm working right now on getting my papers in order to visit Iran, and fingers crossed that's going to come through soon. And if I do, and I'm able to actually go to the motherland, to the source of all this, I think I'm going to go deeper into this approach to cooking and this tradition of, you know, things that come from the Silk Road. So I kind of feel like that's where I'm going. But, but we'll see. I don't want to jinx anything by uh, saying it too soon. Silk Road, that's amazing. I love that thread line through this, too, the, the ingredients and how you tie that in. It's really fantastic. What is on your food bucket list? Oh boy. Well, one thing I really want to do is after uh, I get deeper into the Iran thing is I'd love to explore the heritage of my mom's side, which is Russian, German, and Polish. And I would love to go to that part of the world mm -hmm. and really immerse myself. And the interesting thing that I found, and which was really surprising in researching this book, mm -hmm is how much those two areas have in common because mm. there's been cultural exchange for thousands of years, whether it be by, you know, war and conquering or just by trade. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I found pickles and dill and, and raw onions and pickled fish and yeah. caviar and lots of super sour flavors, you know, all throughout Eastern Europe and then, of course, into Iran and, and the Persianate sphere of influence. So I kind of want to go to that part of the world and see what all the similarities are. Very cool. 
So we've just got a couple more questions left, um, and we're going to open it up to the Q and A portion. So if anybody has questions, you know, please use the microphones that are in the audience. So I like to wrap things up with kind of a off the cuff portion. Finish this sentence. So just a few questions. I'm inspired by Yotam Ottolenghi, the <laughs> yeah. the author, the co-author with Sammy Tamimi of the cookbook Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I Amazing. love how the two of them have brought these really exotic flavors to a bigger audience in a really beautiful, easy to understand way. And I feel like they've kind of changed the whole dialogue about cooking here. Suddenly everybody's super into Middle Eastern cooking. Yeah. Fantastic. Three things that are always in my fridge are? Huh. <laughs> Peanut butter, <laughs> miso paste, and tamarind puree. I don't know if those three go together, but I bet she could make something very interesting they with them. They can. They all will kick up the flavor of a bowl of ramen. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I'm going to try that. <laughs> when no one is watching, I eat... A big bowl of soup that has peanut butter and miso <laughs> in it and all different kinds of vegetables like winter squash and shiitakes and scallions and ginger and carrots. That sounds really good. Had it this morning. Yeah. If I weren't a chef, I would be... I guess... I would be a full-time writer. I can see you on your way to that. An academician, I should be more exact. I guess I would delve deeply into food history and really the theories and the foundations of everything. Very interesting. The last question. When Jackie comes to my house for dinner, I am going to make her... <laughs> I am going to make her Persian rice pie, which is rice with a layer of cooked chicken, roasted chicken, and yogurt, and barberries, and then another layer of rice on top, cooked to a crisp so the top is covered with the golden tadig, and the inside is tender. And it's comforting, it's, it's rich, it's savory. I can't wait. It's special occasion food. I'm going to make it for you. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, well, thanks so much. We have a question over here. Yeah. Um, hi. So I w first I want to say how I'm kind of excited to see this because it seemed for years that, at least in English language, it was kind of the legendary p cuisine of Persia was the only cookbook that really that was available that I could find. Oh, you know about that book? Oh, yeah. I totally own it. It's an awesome <laughs> cookbook. But I'm excited to see more. Um, I guess when I think of Iran, you know, the first thing that comes to a lot of people's mind is saffron. You know, they produce mm -hmm. what everyone considers the world's best saffron. And I was kind of actually surprised that you apparently can get what claims to be Iranian saffron here in the U.S., which I wouldn't have thought was legal. But um, where, where, where do you think, like, where should I go to get, like, you know, the really the best saffron that I can find? Do you know? Do you mean here in New York or just in general? Whatever. Here in New York. Let's well, let's start with here in New York. Well, here in New York, I usually go to Kalustian's. I was going to yeah, say. Yeah, that's where I would go. To. Yeah. yeah. Right? It's amazing. But, you know, you could also, um, I think, does Penzi's still have a store in New York? Penzi's, the mail order spice company, did they close? Oh, that's too bad because they have such high quality ingredients. Even things like sumac or saffron, I would go to them first because they're really fresh and they know their sources. So, so I guess there's no secret places in like the Iranian community where they like have Well, <laughs> now that you've asked, <laughs> you could go out to Great Neck, Long Island, mm -hmm. where there's a big community of Persian Jews and there's grocery stores and there's restaurants. So you might, if you paid off the right person, be able to get some real authentic Iranian saffron. Thank you. Nice. Well, thank you so much for coming in. This is so fantastic to get to have you here and talk about this beautiful book. Thanks, thank you so Jackie. Much. Thank you very much.